Hello everyone. Welcome to Simply Learn's YouTube channel. Today we will be discussing Java interview questions. We all know that Java is one of the most sought programming languages in the current IT industry. There are multiple multi-million dollar companies which are using Java till today. So this video is completely dedicated to help out the Java developers and the beginners in Java programming language to crack the most frequently asked Java interview questions. So without further ado, let's begin with our interview questions. At first, we will start with the beginner level interview questions. So in the beginner level interview questions, the first question we have is, what is JIT? So the answer for this question is, JIT is an abbreviation for Java in time compiler. It increases efficiency of the interpreter by compiling the bytecode in the runtime. JIT or just in time compiler compiles code to machine level directly for higher speeds of code execution. So basically just in time compilation is a feature added to the interpreter of Java. So this involves conversion of the code directly to machine level during the compilation stage. This improvises the speed of execution of a Java program. Now after the first question, the second question in the docket is what is a class loader? Now let's discuss the answer for this particular question. So basically class loader is the first file to load when you execute any Java program. So the Java class loader is the integrated part of Java virtual machine. So the functionality of class loader is to load the class to the Java virtual machine while it is demanded to execute a class. Java has bootstrap extension and application type of class loaders. So the third question in the docket is what are the memory allocations available in Java? So the answer for this particular question is Java provides multiple types of memory allocations, but the five major types of memory allocations which are most frequently used are class memory, heap memory, stack memory, program counter memory, native method stack memory. So the next question in the list is, will the program run if I write static public void main? So basically we write public static void main, but in case imagine if I write the program as static public void main, will the program execute properly? So the answer for this question is yes. Because Java does not follow any specific rule for the order of specifiers you place in your program. So when you execute the program with such pattern in your specifiers, then the program will compile successfully. Also, it will run successfully. So the next question we have is, what is the default value stored in local variables? So in C programming language, when you declare a local variable or a global variable or any type of variable, then the first value which is stored inside that variable will be a garbage value unless you initialize the variable with a personalized value. For example, if you declare a variable i equal to zero, then you are storing a value in that variable i that is zero. If you just declare it as int i, then the value stored inside that i variable will be a garbage value. So similarly, when you declare some kind of local variable in Java, then what will be the default value stored inside it? So the answer for this question is neither the local variables or the global variables or any primitives or any object references do not have any kind of default value stored in them. So followed by the fifth question, we have the sixth question. So what would be the output of the following code segment is the sixth question. So this might happen sometimes. So basically what happens is your interviewer will throw a question at you which has a code segment. So all you need to do is decode that code in your mind and provide the output. So this would be the code that we will be dealing with. So you can see our question has two printf statements. The first one has 100 plus 100 plus a string which is simply learn. And in the second printf statement, we have a string that is e-learning company plus 100 plus 100. So what will be the output of these two printf statements? So the answer for this question is really simple. So we'll be having 200 simply learn as the first output and e-learning company 
100100 as the second output. Why? Let's check out the code segment once again. So when you see the code segment once again, so the first printf statement has 100 plus 100 plus simply learn. So JVM here understands 100 as an integer value and the plus symbol as an addition operator here. So followed by the addition operator, we have another integer value. So what JVM does is it adds the two numbers 100 plus 100. So followed by that we have another plus symbol here. So followed by the plus symbol we have a string value. So here the JVM considers the plus symbol as a concatenating operator but not as an addition operator. So that's why the first two numbers got added and the result was 200 and the next two values were concatenated. So it became as 200 simply learn. Similarly in the second printf statement the JVM encountered with a string value. So it considered the plus symbol as a concatenating operator. Similarly it happened with the second plus symbol as well. So that's the reason we had e-learning 100100 as the second output. Now followed by the sixth question we have the seventh question. What is an association? So the answer for this question is an association can be defined as a relationship that has no ownership over the other. So to understand this definition we can consider a simple example. Consider a person associated with multiple banks. So consider person X who has got accounts in bank A, bank B and bank C. And similarly, a bank is associated with person X. That is a bank A, bank B and bank C are associated with the person X. But no one has ownership over the other. A person X who is an account holder with all the three banks that is A, B and C does not possess any kind of ownership over the three banks. Similarly, banks A, B and C who has the customer which is the person X but the banks do not possess any kind of ownership over the customer. So the relationship between the person X and the banks A, B, C can be considered as an association. Now followed by the seventh question, we have the next question that is the eighth question. Define copy constructor in Java. So the answer for this question is as follows. A copy constructor in Java is a constructor that initializes an object through another object of the same class. A copy constructor in Java is really helpful because when you want to copy a complex object that has several fields or when we want to make a deep copy of an existing object then the copy constructor is the one which will help you out in this situation. So followed by the eighth question we have the ninth question. What is a marker interface? So the answer for this question is an empty interface in Java is referred as a marker interface. Serializable and clonable are some of the popular examples of marker interface. So basically a marker interface is just another interface but normally in interface we provide some signatures. So these signatures belong to particular methods. So in normal interface we just have method signatures but not the complete implementation or at least we'll be having some variables. But in a marker interface we do not have any kind of data manipulating method signatures, any data members, nothing. They have special functionality unlike a normal interface. So followed by the ninth question we have the tenth question. What is object cloning? I guess the word object cloning is completely self-explanatory. Yet the answer for this question is it is an ability to recreate an object completely similar to the existing object. This process is known as object cloning in Java. Java provides a built-in function or method that is the clone method to clone an existing object offering the same functionality that of the original object. So followed by the 10th question we have our 11th question. Why is Java not completely object oriented? So this question might be a little confusing but it's true Java is not completely object oriented. But what's the reason? Yes, I'll explain you why Java is not completely object oriented. 
So the answer for this question is Java is not considered as 100% object oriented programming language because of the data types it uses. It still makes use of eight or more primitive data types which are int, float, double and few others. So this is the only reason why Java is not considered as completely 100% object oriented programming language. So the next question is define wrapper classes in Java. So the answer for this question is in Java when you declare primitive data types that is the int, float, double etc. then the wrapper classes are responsible for converting them into objects or reference types. Just as we discussed before Java is not 100% object oriented programming language just because of the primitive data types it uses. So when you include such primitive data types then wrapper classes are the ones which convert them into objects or reference types for the ease of compilation and execution of programs without any issues. So followed by this question we have the next question define singleton classes in Java. So the answer for this question is in Java when you make the constructor of a class as private then the particular class can generate only one single object. This is the reason why such type of classes are called as singleton classes. So followed by that we have our next question that says define package in Java. So if you use some of the popular IDEs that is the integrated development enterprises such as IntelliJ or Eclipse then you might be familiar with projects, packages, source files and then the class file. So basically you create a project first and inside the project you will be having your source folder and then you will be creating your own package using the source folder and inside the package you will create a class file and inside the class file is where you write your Java program. So here the question is define package in Java. So the answer for this question is as follows. Package is a collective bundle of classes and interfaces along with necessary libraries and JAR files. The use of packages helps in code reusability. So basically when you create a specific package, inside that package you will store all the class files that you will be using in your Java program. So not only class files, in case if you use any kind of connectors or any kind of jar files or any kind of dependencies for your Java program you will include all those inside the package so that the requirements and the class files are bundled together and this helps out in code reusability making sure that the program files or the jar files or any dependencies are not juggling between one package to the other or one file to the other. So using a package is basically a good practice. So followed by this we have our next question. Can you implement pointers in Java program? So if you remember C programming language we had pointers there. So we use pointers to directly access the memory. So similarly can you use pointers in a Java program? This is a little tricky question for beginners but basically it's really simple. Now the answer for this question is no because Java virtual machine personally takes care of memory management implicitly. So Java's major motto was to keep programming simple. So accessing memory directly through pointers is not a recommended action. So the answer is a big no you cannot implement pointers in Java program. So followed by that we have our next question. Differentiate between instance and local variables. So the answer for this question is really simple. Instance variables are declared inside a class and the scope is limited to only a specific object inside which an instance variable is created. So followed by the instance variable we have the local variable. So the local variable can be anywhere inside a method or a specific block of code. Also the scope is limited to the block of code where the variable that is the local variable is declared. Now followed by the 16th question we have our next question. Explain Java string pool. So the answer for this question is a collection of strings in Java's heap memory is referred as Java's string pool. So for example you wanted to create a new string. 
consider your name. So your name might be some XYZ. So if you wanted to create XYZ string, then you provide that particular code to your JVM. So what does JVM do? It will not directly create that particular string. First, it will search for the XYZ string in your string pool. If that is already existing in your string pool, then it will provide a reference to that particular string. In case if XYZ is not there, then the JVM will create a new string that is the XYZ string. So followed by this, we have our next question that is, what is an exception? So the answer for this question is, an exception in Java is considered as an unexpected event that can disrupt the normal flow of the program. So for example, just consider that you are going to write a program for division operator. So after you finish your program, your evaluator might want to test your code to the extreme levels. So instead of providing a proper number, imagine that your evaluator is providing a wrong input, such as special symbols, sometimes zero or any other sort of input. So if this kind of input is provided to your program, then your program might crash. So you can avoid this kind of crash by using exception handling. So basically you can use try and catch blocks. So you can embed your code inside the try block and say to your program that if any kind of wrong input such as special symbol or zero is provided by the evaluator, then send a message saying wrong input or divide by zero exception. So this kind of approach will provide an output, but this kind of approach will avoid your program from crashing. So this is how exceptions are handled in real time. So followed by this, we have our next question. What is final keyword in Java? So the answer for this question is, the term final is a predefined word in Java that is used while declaring values to variables. When a value is declared using the final keyword, then that particular value of that particular variable will remain constant throughout the execution of program. So sometimes if you include a normal variable and provide an operation on that particular variable, then the value of that particular variable will change after the execution of program. But when you declare the same variable using final keyword, then no number of operations or any kind of manipulations applied onto that variable will not change the value of that particular variable. So that's the speciality of final keyword in Java. So followed by that, we'll dive into the next question. That is, what happens when the main method is not declared as static? So the answer for this question is, when the main method is not declared as static, then the program may be compiled perfectly, but ends up with a serious ambiguity and throws a runtime error that says no such method error. So when you basically declare a main method, don't forget to specify the static keyword. So with this, we finish the beginner segment of questions followed by the beginner's segment. We have the next segment that is the intermediate level segment. So the first question in the intermediate level is, what is JDK and mention the variants of JDK? So the answer for this question is, so JDK is basically an abbreviation for Java Development Kit. This is a combined package of JRE, that is the Java Runtime Environment and Developer Tools used for designing Java applications and applets. Oracle has the following variants for Java Development Kit. So the first one is the JDK Standard Edition, which is normally used by beginners and intermediate developers. Next, after the JDK Standard Edition, we have the Java Development Kit for Enterprise. So this particular enterprise edition is used by professional Java developers for developing Java based applications and frameworks. Now the last one is the Java development kit micro edition. Now followed by 21st question, we will dive into the next question that says brief access specifiers and types of access specifiers in Java. So the answer for this question is as follows. Basically, access specifiers are 
predefined keywords used to help a Java virtual machine to understand the scope of a particular data member or data manipulating method within a class or outside the class. So in Java, we have four types of access specifiers. The first one is public access specifier. So when you declare a data member or a data manipulating method as public, then that particular data member or method can be accessible by any class or object throughout the package. Followed by that, we have the private access specifier. So unlike the public access specifier, when you provide the private access specifier, then the accessibility of that particular private data member or the data manipulating method will be provided to specific classes and specific objects only. And finally, we have the protected access specifier. So the protected access specifier is a bit more secure than the private access specifier. So the access for this particular protected data member or protected data manipulating method could be a little more difficult to access unless you are going to implement everything which is present in that particular package. So basically, if you are trying to access the protected data member or protected data manipulating method, of a different package, then you need to first import the package into your existing package. So that's how the protected access specifier works practically. So finally, after the major three access specifiers, we have the default access specifier. So default access specifier will be provided by the Java virtual machine. So in case if you declare a variable or a data manipulating method without using any specific access specifiers that are public, private and protected, then JVM implicitly considers the default access specifier. So there is no much of a difference between the public access specifier and the default access specifier. Both have the same functionality and accessibility. So followed by this question, we enter into the next question that is, can a constructor return a value? So the answer for this question is as follows. Yes, a constructor can return a value. It basically returns the current instance of a class implicitly. You cannot make a constructor return a value explicitly, but automatically it returns the instance of a class. So the next question is explain this keyword in Java. So in Java, we do have a keyword which is called as this. So what does the keyword this mean in Java is the question. So the answer for this question is the term this is a special keyword designated as a reference variable. So the term this keyword is used to refer to the current class properties like data manipulating method, instance, data member and constructors. So followed by the 24th question, we have our next question that says explain super keyword in Java. So the answer for this question is as follows. The term super is a special keyword designated as a reference variable. So similar to this keyword, even super keyword acts as a reference variable. But the difference is super keyword is used to refer to the immediate parent class object. So followed by the 25th question, we have our next question that is explain method overloading in Java. So basically method overloading and method overriding, etc. are the concepts of polymorphism. So now let's have a correct answer here. So the process of creating multiple method signatures using one method name is called as method overloading. So for example, consider that you wanted to include an addition operation in your program that performs addition operation. So the first method will be having the name add and inside the method parameters, you'll be having two integer types of parameters. Similarly, you wanted to perform another addition operation with the same name add. So here you will provide the method name completely same to the first method, but inside the parameters, there is a difference. You are adding three parameters here. So when you pass the values to the add method, then which method to be overloaded? That's the confusion, right? So 
should I overload or should I execute the first add method or the second add method? So this completely depends on the number of parameters you pass. If you are passing two parameters, then the first method will be executed. If you are passing three parameters, then the second method will be executed. So this is how the method overloading happens in Java. So the process of method overloading can be achieved by using two different ways. The first way is to change the number of arguments. So that's what exactly I've discussed before. Now the second way is varying the return type of the method. So with this, let's enter into the next question. Can we overload a static method? So as discussed before, the values of the variables or data manipulating methods will not be changed when we have used the keyword static in front of it. So the question is, can we overload a static method? Now let's discuss the answer for this. The answer is no. Java does not support overloading of static method. The process worked through an error reading static method cannot be referenced. So followed by this, we have our next question. So the next question is define late binding. The answer for this question is binding is a process of unifying the method call with the method's code segment. Late binding happens when the method's code segment is unknown till the method is called during the runtime. So followed by this, we have our next question. Define dynamic method dispatch. So the answer is the dynamic method dispatch is a process where the method call is executed during the runtime. The overridden method is called through a reference variable of superclass. So this process is called as runtime polymorphism. Now we have our next question. Why is delete function faster in linked list than an array? So basically linked list and array are the Java collections or in other words, it's also considered as data structure. So to answer this question, you need to understand the analogy of linked list and array. So basically an array is a complete memory block of consecutive memory locations. So consider that your memory location starts from 100 and your array has 10 locations. So it's a complete reserved block of from 100 101, 102 to 109. So you have 10 memory blocks. So in case if you wanted to add a number or a delete a number, then you had to make changes to the complete memory block. But when you come into linked list, you have the memory blocks used from the memory heap. So basically what you do here is you basically connect the nodes through addresses. So in case if you wanted to eliminate a number, then what you do is just to manipulate the addresses. So the address of the consecutive node will be changed. So that's the only change what you make. So now this is the reason why the delete function or any kind of manipulation function is faster in linked list compared to array. So now let's have a brief answer on this. Delete function is faster in linked list as the user needs to make a minor update to the pointer value so that the node can point to the next successor in the list. Now followed by this, we have our next question. Give a briefing on the life cycle of a thread. So the life cycle of a thread includes five stages, which are as mentioned below, newly born state, runnable state that is it provides the JVM with a feedback that I'm ready to run now followed by that the running stage where the thread is actually running followed by that the block stage. So basically the thread will be blocked for some reasons for some intermediate output or something if the thread is waiting for an input from another source or something similar. So that's where the blocked state comes to existence. And finally, the dead state. Once after everything is processed, the threat is eliminated by GVM. Now followed by this, we have our next question that says, explain the differences between the operators provided here. So the operators might look similar, but they are different. Now let's understand about these operators in a much better way through the answer. 
So the answer for this question is, although they look similar, but there's a huge difference between them. So the first operator, which looks like two greater than symbols, perform the operation of right shifting. So when you provide a binary number or binary value, then the bits will be shifted towards the right. And the second symbol or the second operator, which is having three greater than symbols is used to shift out the zero filled bits. So this is the functionality of these two operators. Now followed by that, let's have the 33rd question. Brief the life cycle of an applet. So the answer for this question is the life cycle of an applet basically involves the following stages. The first stage is the initialization stage. Next is the start stage. Third is the stop stage. Fourth is destroy and finally we have paint. Now the next question is why are generics used in Java? So the answer for this question is compile time type safety is provided by using generics in Java. So this approach allows the users to catch unnecessary invalid inputs at the time of compilation. Generic methods and classes help programmers to specify a single method declaration, a set of related methods, or with a single class declaration, a set of related types. So followed by this, we have our next question. Explain externalizable interface. So the answer for this question is, the externalizable interface helps with the control over the process of serialization. The externalization interface incorporates read external and write external methods. So we have listened to a new term here, which is serialization. So what exactly is serialization? Serialization is a process of sending your Java code or Java project from one computer system to a different computer system. So basically, if you wanted to execute some kind of Java program from a different location, then you serialize this particular code to a different location where you actually want to execute. And this particular process of transferring your code is called as serialization. Now, the next question is explain daemon thread. So the answer for this question is the daemon thread can be defined as a thread with least responsibility. The daemon thread is designed to run in a background during the process of garbage collection in Java. The set daemon method is used to create the daemon thread in Java programming language. So we have our next question now. Explain the term enumeration in Java. So the answer for this question is enumeration or enum is an interface in Java. Enum allows the sequential access of elements stored in a collection in Java. Now, the next question is, why is Java considered as a dynamic programming language? So the answer for this question is, Java was designed to adapt to an evolving environment. Java programs include large amount of runtime information that is actually used to resolve access to the objects in real time. So this is the reason why Java is considered as dynamic programming language. Now, followed by this, we have our next question. Can you run a code before executing the main method? So the answer for this question is yes, we can execute any code even before the main method. We will be using the static block of code in the class when creating the objects at load time of the class. Any statements within the static block of the code will execute it once while loading the class, even before the creation of objects in the main method. Now, the last question in the intermediate section is how many times the finalized method is called? So the answer for this question is the finalized method is called by the garbage collector. So for every object, the garbage collector calls the finalized method just for once. Now with this, let's enter the advanced segment of interview questions based on Java. So the first question in the advanced segment is, can the keywords this and super be used together? So the answer for this question is, no, this and super keywords should be used in the first statement in the class constructor. So the following code segment will give you a better idea. So you can see that we have used the keyword super and this in the class constructor. That is the first class constructor. 
Now this is how you can use super keyword and this keyword together in case if you wanted to use. So with this let's continue with the next question in the advanced level. So the next question says explain JSP page. So the answer for this question is JSP is basically an abbreviation for Java servlet page. So the Java servlet page consists of two types of text. The first is the static data and the second one is Java servlet page elements. Now the next question is explain JDBC. So the answer is JDBC is an abbreviation for Java Database Connector. JDBC is an abstract layer used to establish connectivity between any existing database and to a Java application. Next question is explain the various directives of JSP. So the directives are instructions processed by JSP engine. After the JSP page is compiled into a servlet, directives are used to set page level instructions, insert data from external files and specify custom tag libraries. Directives are defined between the following symbols. So these are the symbols that are used to specify the directives in a JSP page. The different types of directives are shown as below. There are three types of directives. They are include directive, page directive and tag lib directive. So include directive includes a file and merges the content of the file with the current page. The page directive is used to define specific attributes in the JSP page like error page and buffer. The tag lib directory is used to declare a custom tag library which is used in the JSP page. Followed by that we have the next question. What are observer and observable classes? So the answer for this question is objects that subclass the observable class maintain a list of observers. When an observable object is updated, it invokes the update method of each of the observers to notify that the observers that it has changed its state. The observer interface is implemented by objects that observe observable objects might be a little confusing but you need to read this answer once again you can pause it and you can read this answer once again so that you can get a brief understanding of this followed by that we have the next question what is session management in Java so the answer for this question is a session is essentially defined as the dynamic stage of a random conversation between the client and the server. The essential communication channel includes the string of responses and requests from both sides. Typically, the most popular way of implementing session management is the employment of a session ID in the communicative discourse of the client and the server. The next question is brief about Spring Framework. Spring Framework is basically the framework of frameworks. Now the answer for this question is Spring is essentially defined as the application framework and inversion of control container for Java. Basically the chief purpose of Spring Framework is to create enterprise applications in Java. Also, it is especially useful to keep in mind that the central features of the Spring Framework are essentially conductive to any Java application. So the next question is explain JCA in Java. So the answer for this question is JCA is basically an abbreviation for Java cryptography architecture. So JCA provides a platform that gives architecture and APIs for encryption as well as decryption. JCA is used by the developer to combine the application with the security measure. It also helps in performing the third party security rules. It uses the hash table, encryption message digest, etc. to implement the security. So the next question is explain JPA in Java. So the answer for this question is JPA stands as an abbreviation for Java Persistence API. The JPA is enabling us to create the persistence layer for desktop and web applications. JPA deals with the following Java Persistence API, Query Language, Java Persistence Criteria API, Object Mapping Metadata, etc. So the last question in our list is explain the different authentications in Java servlets. So the answer for this question is 
Authentication options available in servlets are as follows. The first one is basic authentication. So the basic authentication consists of username and password provided by the client to authenticate as the user. The second one is form based authentication. In this particular type of authentication, the login form is made by the programmer by using HTML. Followed by that, we have the third type of authentication that is digest authentication. Digest authentication is similar to basic authentication, but in this the passwords are encrypted using hash formula. This makes digest more secured. And lastly, we have the client certificate authentication. The client certificate authentication requires that each client accessing the resource has a certificate that it sends to authenticate itself. This requires SSL protocol. So with that, we have come to an end of this particular tutorial based on Java interview questions. If you have any queries regarding the interview questions session we had today, or if you feel that we have missed out some important interview questions that we were supposed to cover in this particular tutorial, then please feel free to drop them down in the comment section below and we will have your questions answered and also we will consider every suggestion provided by you. So with that, this is Ravi signing off. Until next time, thank you. Hi there, if you like this video, subscribe to the Simply Learn YouTube channel and click here to watch similar videos. To nerd up and get certified, click here.